Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're just going to give people a few moments to sign in and then we'll be starting shortly. Good morning, thanks for joining us for the Germany Real Estate Results event. My name is Warren Sachs and I'm an associate on the Grez Real Estate team. We're glad to have such a great turnout. ESG continues to become even more important for real estate, for the real estate sector in Germany. Hopefully this will be our last virtual event and we can meet you in person next year. We have an interesting and exciting program before I turn it over to Ingemar Kunold from an Enviro sustain a few quick housekeeping items. The webinar is being recorded and the slide deck will be posted online and distributed after the event. If you have questions, please ask them by using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And at the end, we'll also have time for some live questions. And now I'll turn it over to Ingemar. Thanks, Warren. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Also on behalf of Enviro Sustain. Um, we're a Berlin-based uh, ESG consultancy um, and are today's host uh, for the RESP uh, event for Germany. Um, <clears throat> so we put together, um, we think, a quite interesting program for you. So uh, in the beginning, um, Warren will run us uh, through the RESP results and also show us a little analysis, also with some focus um, on Germany. Um, followed by that, is then um, a session where we, where we have invited um, three software providers for ESG performance data, um, where we are really excited about, um, just to share um, their experiences they have so far in the market. Um, and maybe then together, we can also discuss um, where the hurdles are in terms of collecting data, but where also all the participants um, might see future potential. Um, so having said that, um, I would like to pass it on to Warren um, and not waste any of our valuable time uh, on the introduction and just give it a go for the GRASP results for Germany. Great, thanks so much. Uh, today I will cover high level results from this year's assessment, three exciting new products in our pipeline, and I will speak to the future of the GRASP assessment and roadmap. Over the last 12 years, Grez's benchmark has grown and evolved to meet industry needs and challenges head on. Arguably, there has never been a more important time for Grez, its assessment, and its members, as the growing risk of climate change continues to accelerate. Investors are critical to the growth of the benchmark. These investors incentivize their investees to participate in the assessment, indirectly increasing the benchmark. This results in higher data quantity, which eventually leads to higher data quality through a better representation of the industry as a whole. We were thrilled to see a 24% increase globally despite COVID. This is the largest increase in the participation in the history of GRESP. You should note that this also increased our listed universe by 20% and our non-listed universe by 25%. A quick breakdown by sector. On the left, you'll find the entity breakdown and on the right, you'll find the asset breakdown by sector. Worth noting that on the entity side, the most prominent sector is diversified, which refers to companies and funds that do not have more than 75% of their gross asset value that belongs to a specific sector. This diversified classification does not exist at the asset level on the right-hand side, where you will note the most prominent sector is industrial. Benchmark results, Europe outgrew other region when it comes to the number of participants with a total of 784 entities this year, representing a growth of 29%. It now covers 117 assets in 66 countries. We're gonna have a quick look at the GRES model and the scores for this year. I'm sure most of you on the call are familiar with the GRES model. For those of you that aren't, this model represents the GRES scores according to two dimensions. The management component on the y-axis consisting of 30% of the total GRES score 
and the performance component on the x-axis consisting of 70% of the total gross score. Global, global averages steadily increased over the last 10 years with the exception of last year when there was restructuring to the assessment. This year, scores did increase once again. Oceana continues to be the leader. It's worth noting that Europe has the highest number of participants as mentioned, and this brings down the average. And finally, we do receive a lot of questions on the numbers of stars and quantiles. Uh, we are providing the cutoff points for various numbers of the stars on the right-hand side, where you can observe that they have significantly increased compared to last year, making competition for the four and five stars even more difficult. Now we're looking at the same model with a country breakdown. You will observe that European countries are pretty scattered across the chart with wider discrepancies between averages. Again, this is mostly due to a high number of new participants in some countries, among others. Great news is Germany added 30 new participants, an impressive 65% increase compared to last year. The German participant score increased from 59 in 2020 to 62 in 2021. This year, German participants had four five-star ratings and five four-star ratings to note. The Windrose display is a comparison of Germany, and the, which is the dark green line, and Europe, which is the light green shaded portion. German participants did score well in the management aspect, including policies, leadership, and stakeholder engagement. German participants are lagging behind Europe in, performance as, in the performance aspect of the assessment, but have a clear commitment to make continuous improvements. Performance data is where the most advanced participants differentiate themselves from their peers. To better understand the impacts of COVID on their performance data, GRESB created a brief survey to gain deeper insights. We will share some of the findings as we move through this portion of the presentation. In terms of data coverage, many of us, including GRESB, was expecting COVID to prevent organizations from efficiently engaging with their tenants in order to collect ESG data. COVID was not the obstacle we were expecting with an overall increase in data coverage percentage across all sectors and for key indicators. Looking at the actual asset intensities, we do note a decrease overall across most sectors. We attribute this to both efficiency and less activity, specifically COVID. For like-for-like -like changes, there was a decrease for both energy and GHG as well. The second part of the presentation now that I'll be focusing on is three new products that we'll be launching shortly. In December, GRES will launch its transition risk report, which leverages on the existing ESG data from our platform, so no additional input is required. For those that don't have full data coverage, this report will be this report will fill in the gaps and estimate what has not been reported to produce a full picture of transition risk. Finally, key insights will be built on the global CREM decarbonization pathways, allowing for essentially any entity, whether regionally or globally diversified, to generate key insights with regard to its transition risk. Please visit our website for more details on this. Next, we have the SFDR reporting solution, which will be launching next year. Similar to the transition risk report, this product will leverage on existing ESG data on our platform and allow efficient reporting for participants. It will, however, require additional input since some of the SFDR requirements are not covered by the GRES assessment. This product will support the disclosure of both Article 17 and 7 on principal adverse impact statements. Please join us on an upcoming webinar. And lastly, we have the TCFD alignment report, which will be launched next year. As some of you know, the EU have officially endorsed the TCFD recommendations as reporting requirements. Given the full sets of TCFD recommendations are already represented in the GRESB assessment, this solution will allow participants to benefit from a TCFD aligned report without any additional input. Please see our website and we're super excited about this as well. Uh, lastly, I'm briefly going to cover the GRESB has formally started the work on our assessment roadmap, which aims to redevelop both the real estate and infrastructure assessment over the next five to 10 years. 
The first phase of this process is to collect feedback from our members through a roadmap survey that we shared in late September. If you haven't done so, please take the time to fill in the survey. Yeah, there's a QR code here for you to scan if you like. You can also found the link on our website. This feedback is extremely valuable to us and ultimately to you. Receiving sufficient feedback will ensure this process is industry-led, which is paramount and very important. Please share that link with your organization. We do allow multiple responses per organization. This is extremely important to ensure the vision of the assessment represents the industry as a whole, as it will serve as the foundation for phase two and three of the process. That was it for results, products, and the roadmap. Thank you for your time. And if you have questions, please let me know. So I will take over from here again and just uh, briefly introduce um, our participants and speakers um, for the panel discussion as well as for the short presentation. So we will start off uh, with Mr. Jens Hirsch, um, who's representing Building Minds here today. Um, again, a Berlin-based um, software solution for ESG performance data. Um, and he will run us briefly through what Building Minds can do. Um, then followed by that, uh, we will have Emmanuel Blanchet from uh, DeepKey, uh, Paris-based software provider in that respect. Um, who will also give us a, a short wrap up um, of where they see the future when it comes to, to digitalization and ESG. Um, and then we will close that session with um, Ayosha Ord from Evora Global, um, who will provide us an update um, on where they stand with the software solution Sierra. Um, and then after that, uh, we will hopefully have quite some time um, to discuss a, a few prepared questions, but also to see uh, what the audience has on their mind um, in respect to the presentations we are going to see. So I will pass it on to Jens now um, that he can start off with building minds. Um, and as Sasha is writing also in the bottom, please feel free uh, also using the Q&A um, in between. Over to you. Thanks. Yes, thanks, Ingemar. Um, happy to be here. Thanks for that opportunity. Um, so my name is Jens Hirsch. I'm Domain Expert Sustainability at Building Minds um, and was previous project lead also of the Prem Carbon Risk Real Estate Monitor. So I hope I can, um, yes, I can switch to the next slide. Thanks. So who is Building Minds? Uh, we are a Berlin-based startup founded by our sole investor Schindler, the Schindler Elevator Company. And um, we are around 100 industry tech digitization experts from over 30 countries and developing a digital building management platform with a strong focus on ESG. You can also see Microsoft here um, with a cl close collaboration with Microsoft, which is our official technology partner. So what are we doing finally? Um, as all you know, um, there's a lot of data out there around, around real estate, but very fragmented um, from utility providers, ERP system, um, IoT, building management systems, and so on. And our target, our aim is to, to provide our customers with the possibility to get all these data together and create value add from this. Um, we do this by different approaches uh, for data collection and integration. So we extract data with machine learning models from existing files and documents. We integrate into existing systems um, and we've also developed a data capture um, survey app, which allows you to crowdsource the, the data collection process within your company. Um, so getting the data together that is around there is regarded as the key for us to, to improve your ESG um, score. So next slide, please. Um, so in order to make this possible, besides the Capture X tool, our survey app that I've just uh, mentioned, we have a small um, a collection of um, partner companies 
um, that support in the data collection process, um, including utility providers, Urgenet, um, and the installation of IoT sensors. If you go to the next slide. Um, so what do we offer finally? Um, necessary ingredients to do your sustainability assessment and sustainability reporting. So first of all, Building Minds is an ESG platform, as we say, with a plus. So we provide you with innovative data gathering capabilities. We can connect directly via APIs to IoT sensors, utility providers, and so on. And finally, um, we are founding member of um, the IBPDI, International Buildings Performance and Data Initiative, which we have explained here is the secret source. Within IBPDI, we are developing a data model um, to standardize the data in the real estate sector, as we can see on the next slide. So what is IBPDI? Um, besides Building Minds, um, three further founding members are Microsoft Pom Plus and RICS, but um, currently the initiative um, has more than 50 active members that are trying to develop a consistent standard of data for real estate, the common data model, um, which can be used for easy data collection, data exchange, and the creation of applications also based on that standardized data model. Next slide, please. So this is um, what we are, the whole picture to put it in a nutshell. So from the current existing, uh, from the current fragmented system um, with many standards and um, that is very fragmented, the common data model that is developed in the IBPDI initiative um, creates standardization and makes data comparable. And finally, we at Building Minds use this common data model <clears throat> to create valuable insights within our platform. If we go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, of course, this cannot, this can be used for sustainability management, but also for all other um, aspects of real estate analytics. So from building, my, uh, building management, workplace management, space monitoring, strategic location management, um, we offer all key real estate KPIs. We can include um, lease contract information, but also financial data um, and um, 3D models of the buildings. Um, including real-time data on well-being um, information like air quality, temperature, and so on. And if we have a little uh, closer look into the platform on the next slide, um, so you can we, we structure this in general into a three-step approach. So first of all, analyze how it is. So get your data onto the platform, by connecting to building mines with your existing platforms or um, via any kind of further integration of systems. And thanks to the CDM, the common data model for real estate, we can integrate the data from these different sources and create the insights on the status quo. So reporting and analytic features on your resource consumption, including energy, water, waste, fugitive emissions, and of course, um, carbon emissions um, structured according to the greenhouse gas protocol, um, including scope one, two, and three emissions. So all what you, everything that you would expect and up to uh, real-time data from IoT sensors on electricity consumption, gas, heating, energy, and as mentioned, well-being parameters as well. So, and once we have collected the data from the present and the past and have analyzed how it is, we can get a step forward to step two to foresee how it will be. And for that um, purpose on the next slide, um, we have 
two aspects here for that future analysis. So first of all, we've integrated the complete CREM methodology and framework. Um, so the decarbonization pathways that are aligned with the Paris climate targets. So you can assess your portfolio against the CREM targets and check how individual buildings perform against their um, individual decarbonization and energy reduction pathways. Check when individual buildings get stranded, assess your stranding risk, and also check portfolio-wide which share of assets has stranded in a certain year, for example. So this will allow you to help to identify um, where action is needed, which buildings need um, action and where you should plan certain improvements. Um, also part of step two, the uh, risk and cost prediction part is our carbon pricing simulator. Since we all do not know how carbon prices will develop and who will have to pay finally, landlords, tenants. So this is very different from country to country and there are a lot of uncertainties. That's why we want to provide our clients with a um, planning tool that allows them to analyze potential carbon costs and create corresponding scenarios for different carbon price futures and calculate carbon price and carbon risk indicators for entire portfolios or individual buildings. And once you have identified the buildings with the highest urgency for action, we offer with step three, our retrofit roadmap that you can use in order to plan your company's specific roadmap towards decarbonization, create retrofits for individual buildings, for example, um, create scenarios of changing to green electricity, changing the heat energy source from oil to gas or to heat pumps, or to create uh, real retrofits and regarding energy efficiency or the thermal envelope of your buildings and directly assess the impact on your building's carbon performance for individual buildings, but as you can see here on the left side, also for your entire portfolio. So make intelligent budget planning when it comes to retrofit, make your portfolio future-proof and assess how different retrofit scenarios that you've created meet and fit with the CREM, but also your company internal decarbonization and sustainability targets. So that's it from my side. Um, if you have any further question, please put them in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Jens, uh, for the brief overview of what Building Minds can do. Um, happy also for the audience to have a deep dive uh, once we are through with, with uh, the remaining two presentations. Um, so I would kindly ask you for your patience. Um, and then I would pass it um, on to Emmanuel, who is uh, joining us from Paris here today. Um, Emmanuel, happy to have a go. Yeah, <laughs> good morning, everyone. You just uh, have to allow me. Yeah, that's okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Emmanuel, um, co-founder and CEO at DeepKey. Uh, and I'm going to... Uh, Let's uh, a journey um, for ESG strategy. I'm going to dive more into the process than into the software, uh, because you probably know that's probably one of the most uh, difficult parts. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, that's me. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, just um, it was the purpose of the, the beginning of the company. We are based in Paris, but now we have teams in Germany, UK, uh, Spain, and Italy. And we go, I, I think we monitor assets throughout the world. But the, clearly, we, we want to just share the journey because uh, getting the data and also uh, answering to uh, initiatives or uh, regulation is not clearly the objective. The objective is clearly to, to get to, to the actions and to the real um, impact, meaning that we all want to uh, get to a pathway, very ambitious pathway. It could be net zero. It could be a, a 1.5 degree trajectory. Um, but clearly, we have to go through all this journey. And even if we want to, to get uh, the final objective, we, we also want to insist on the, the need of real and reliable data 
to be sure that we could provide the proper insights. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's why I just want to, to, to share that with you. Um, another point really important is that we, we don't want to do only a picture. You want to uh, see your ESG strategy and also the data collection process, um, not at the one-off uh, project, meaning that you, you probably know if you have already experienced a grade, a grade assessment that you could be on a rush during the May and June months. But that's uh, clearly uh, what you uh, shouldn't do uh, at the beginning. It could be the, the first year, it could be the case, but afterward, it's not uh, the objective because you will have many initiatives, many regulation, and also our carbon pathway, meaning that you must see uh, this uh, data collection and even the easy strategy more like an ongoing process. You must have throughout all the years the proper data collection as much automatic as possible to be sure that you could fulfill all the initiatives. It could be uh, GRASP, it could be other uh, uh, voluntary initiatives, ECOR in Germany, for example, and also regulation. You all will face SFDR as soon as possible. And then you have your own target and your own uh, ESG reporting, perhaps. So you must collect the data to be sure that it is not one data collection for each initiative, but clearly a proper data collection that allow you to answer to all initiative regulation and your own objectives. That's what we call a movie more than a picture. Um, and like that, you monitoring your real estate portfolio and you don't do audit every year, uh, which is not possible if you really want to fulfill an ambitious trajectory. Next slide, please. So again, we will uh, dive into uh, the data collection process because even if we all want to do this, we know that it's not difficult. Perhaps I, I will reassure people, the data collection uh, setup is clearly uh, one of the uh, toughest parts of the journey. Uh, and then that's why we insist on that. Um, yeah, what, why is it a challenge actually? Because you don't know at the beginning what is really the scope. Uh, again, if you have some funds that answer to the GRASP assessment and other to other initiatives, or uh, you, you have to have a full view of your portfolio. The second point is what data to collect, because you want to collect the more exhaustive data as possible to be sure that you could answer to all initiatives. But also, you, you probably know uh, that we have to be pragmatic. And sometimes, if you ask too many data to property managers and asset managers, it's also a, a good way to have zero data. So we have to just uh, balance uh, between uh, be, being sure that you could do and have all of the insights uh, to do the carbon pathway, but we, we also have to be pragmatic to be sure that we get those data on time. Also, you have many internal resources to allocate. We don't, it, it's, it takes time actually. And also you must, and we will insist on that, we must involve a lot of stakeholders. This is also a good news actually, we will tease that. And another uh, uh, project inside this project is clearly the automation of the data collection. It is not possible, uh, you know, in one month, but it's clearly one thing you, you, you have to keep in mind to be sure that you don't do every year manual data collection, which is not clearly the objective and not the proper way of doing things. Next slide, please. Clearly a, a typical project of data collection must uh, fulfill some clear steps and milestones. You have to launch it with all the stakeholders, again, fund managers, asset managers, property managers, and even tenants. You have to have the proper mapping, meaning that which type of data I want to collect at which level, to be sure also to have like, just the, the I don't want to, to dig more into details, but you have to uh, allocate all the meters, for example, to each building. So that's a, a really important uh, issue. Then you have to mobilize all the relevant stakeholders at the proper level. Then a clear uh, and very important step is the data reliability, all the data quality checks you have to, to, to just uh, uh, do. And then uh, actually, again, it's not an objective to this data collection. So to be sure that after all this data collection, you will have all the information to get insights and take action. Next slide, please. So first is the data mapping and also the data collection uh, uh, issues. Uh, you, we have to, 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 to collect and to classify all those uh, uh, data. We, have, we need to have uh, asset data. Uh, we don't talk about uh, also uh, form data, like for the ESG forms and the GRASP forms, for example. Um, you, you have to, uh, to get information from utilities, information from remote metering, uh, IoT sometimes, also metering. 
as, as much as possible. You have also to, to collect existing data from the BMS, for example. Then you have your, pro, your, your, your own ERP, uh, like tenant information, uh, building information in YARD, SAP, or so on. And then we also could enrich all those data collection with open data. There is many, many data available at, uh, actually uh, uh, globally, but uh, country by country. And then we, we must uh, uh, get those information to be sure that we could, uh, all, all, all data that could be uh, uh, free of uh, energy from uh, asset managers and property managers, uh, it's easier to get that. Uh, obviously, um, uh, we, we got uh, information from the climate information, for example, but so on. We have many technical information available uh, at Open Data, like transportation, but like also technical information on buildings, pictures, so many uh, Open Data information. Next slide, please. And then again, pragmatism first, meaning that you're one, you, 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 you must to have reliable data and uh, as much as possible, you probably know that, for example, uh, what is called performance uh, for Grace for the moment is clearly more uh, data collection uh, rates, meaning that you have to have the more real data as possible. And it's, 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 uh, it's now uh, uh, the timing because we need to have proper data to get inside, but probably in few years, we will have more challenge in the performance than in the data collection because all the market will be more mature on that. Now you probably see the average rate uh, uh, getting between uh, 70 and 80% of real data building by building is quite a, a good score. So we have to get this score and then improve it. So for example, uh, year one uh, automation is not the focus. You have to get the data, but clearly on year two and then after, you, you have to, to increase the automation rate because it's also a way to have real data uh, without uh, any uh, time spending uh, only for data collection and then reduce or decrease the manual uh, uh, information to get more and more reliable data. 100% of real data could be an objective. Uh, if we are pragmatic, I would say between 80 to 95%, you could get uh, all you want uh, in terms of insights because we also have the ability with many algorithms um, uh, to estimate and fill the gap. That's totally uh, possible if you have like 80 or 85% of the um, uh, real data. Next slide, please. So to do that, uh, I could have spoke about uh, machine learning, intelligence artificial, and, and many uh, useful algorithms, but um, actually it's first a process, a question of process, meaning all this data must be first uh, uh, getting into the platform, and then we could analyze it. So to do that, we have to mobilize all the stakeholders, coming, starting from the fund manager, which, which clearly interested on in the results and the communication to investors. But then uh, you have to, to uh, uh, mobilize all the asset managers because they are key players for building information, for tenant information, also for uh, project organization, for, for, for example, for GRESB. Then you probably know that the property managers are clearly in front because they know the buildings, they know and they get a lot of data because they are owners of some contracts. They also are uh, uh, in relationship, close relationship with the tenants. And then we have uh, to uh, mobilize the tenants. But again, the good news is that could appear to be a little bit difficult because there is many stakeholders, but actually it's also a good way to have a different relationship and to start talking with your tenants about ESG, to start talking with property managers, uh, in terms of ESG and strategy, it's also a good news to involve them. A, a, a tricky part for those part of mobilizing stakeholders is that if you have like a pan-European uh, portfolio, for example, uh, it could be different from one country to another because you probably know that the scope of work of property managers are not the same in Switzerland than in France or UK and in Germany, obviously. And then to do so, we have to uh, uh, dedicate some stream country by country to be sure that we get access to the proper information. Next slide, please. Yeah, for example, uh, at each step of the process, we have to involve, for, for example, the portfolio perimeter. Of course, we have to talk with front managers and asset managers. Then for meters mapping, which is more technical information, is clearly the property managers that have the key uh, information. And then we have to uh, get information from the tenants because you know that to have the overview of the all asset and then the whole portfolio, you have to uh, get uh, access to the common collective and private area, meaning that you have to get access to the information. Uh, for example, we need information letter or, or author authorization from the tenants. And then we create the connectors because also uh, at the P sides, we have many connectors to get access to those data, but 
uh, don't forget that we need authorization and key information about meters, for example, to be sure that we could connect all those information. And then it's part of our job. We could collect the data and just put that in, in a huge and very strong, strong database. And then you could have access to insight analysis and reporting. Next slide, please. So if I want to, to sum up uh, all this thing, clearly on the left part, we have many, many data available. But to get access is clearly a question of process involving all the stakeholders and also then connectors and software. Then you could get all those data in a software. DeepKey is a good example, but you know that there is other software in the, in the, in the market. But if you go through DeepKey, then we could uh, get all those data, have a, like, a proper uh, own database, and then use those database to, to just be the basis of your ESG strategy. And in your ESG strategy, you will have monitoring and benchmarking initiatives like GRES, Boricor. Then you could have like scoring and due diligence issue. We have SRI label in France, for example, but you could have also a scoring uh, uh, initiative at Europe. Then, of course, you will have regulation and compliance like SFDR. And then, then again, we all want to have impact and to reduce. You could use some famous frameworks like CREM, or you could use your own net zero strategy but you have to have the proper data to build your strategy and then uh, get uh, actions. Again, uh, on the right, you will have all your stakeholders and just you have to share to all your stakeholders what you really want to do because otherwise they won't understand why you, you, you ask uh, so many questions about the data collection. And then you can create your ESG strategy. Next slide, please. A, a, a point then just to insist on the last point is clearly the, the data quality check to be sure that you have reliable data. Uh, of course, to, if, you, if you build a strategy on, on data that was, wasn't complete, for example, uh, it's clearly an issue. So we have many, uh, I would say automatic, but also uh, process uh, um, checks that uh, could uh, get to a proper data and then to the proper strategy. Next slide, please. So you probably now know, um, uh, uh, share with me uh, the, the, what we call the virtuous real estate and the best way to do, the, to do so. Clearly, you have to start with a vision and a, a, a willingness, a shared willingness uh, from your company, but also your stakeholder. And then you have all the steps from data, inside action, and then to be sure that you could be net zero in 2050, like we all want. Next slide, perhaps a few words about deep key. Oh, no, no, last slide, sorry, sorry about the final objective which is clearly to fulfill an ambitious trajectory. Here, for example, it's a 1.5 degree uh, 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 trajectory uh, uh, using the frame framework. And we have like many actions and many ideas uh, to do so. So we start from real data, then we could forecast with uh, actions, uh, a possible trajectory. And then we will have to follow this trajectory to be sure that all the actions could have the results uh, uh, that uh, uh, you know, allow to uh, follow this uh, ambitious trajectory. So next, and, and the final slide about uh, a key takeaway uh, uh, about my, uh, my presentation, but also our experience uh, since uh, many years of uh, grasp assessment and also uh, ESG strategy uh, uh, implementation. Clearly, there is many uh, uh, key takeaways. I think I, I have uh, already uh, uh, quoted some. Uh, you need also to involve people on your side uh, one uh, single point of contact to be in charge of all these uh, type of initiative to involve the stakeholders, sorry to insist on that, but that's clear. Uh, and that won't be possible alone this journey. And then you have also to, to create and show success stories about data collection, but also about uh, actions and impact. And you have to share your strategy to be sure that all your stakeholders understand what you are doing. Next slide, please. Thank you. And deep key in a few words, uh, we want and, and uh, clearly we, we, are, we have been created for that. We want to accelerate the transition towards net zero and sustainability. And our, our job is to do it with ESG and with data, uh, especially. Uh, we worked in uh, seven years. Like I said, we, we clearly work throughout all the countries in Europe. We have more than 250 customers, which are fund managers, asset managers, and uh, all real estate uh, key players, actually. And we monitor a lot of buildings. Uh, and we are very pleased to uh, answer to all your questions. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks, Emmanuel. 
um, and happy to touch on uh, the specific specific experience on data collection uh, in Germany later on. Um, so happy to hear what you have to say about that. Um, <clears throat> then I would like to pass it on uh, to Ayosha uh, from uh, Ebora Global, um, who will run us a little bit through their latest developments um, of Sierra. Um, and so Ayosha, the stage is yours. Thanks, Ingemar. All right, great session already. Fabulous. Now us, Evora Global. We know you. We are real estate experts with a long track record for now 10 years in the market. We can hit the round running. We have a global outreach, but a clear focus, next slide please, on Europe. We have real estate specialists. We have our own software tool called Sierra, and we focus on end-to-end -end ESG services. Next slide, please. It is really important for us to jump into the details because we have integrated services from ESG strategy setting, agenda setting, over to climate resilience, up to green finance. We believe that this is made for real estate investment managers in specific. Next slide, please. So let me touch a bit on investment grade data and its life cycle. The next one, please. We believe it's time to approach ESG data in, in a new way. We use data analytics and design to help our clients to be the leader in the space. What is the method? Actually, we reimagine how organizations can improve and outperform rivals. We follow a structured method, including people and technology, Sierra and our consultants. In the past, we talked a lot about collecting and managing data. Now it's the question how to take action. We start looking forward. We start to forward impact. So we want to be proactive and actually align strategic data partnerships. Next slide, please. What is investment grade data? In order to do so, to have investment grade data in place, we have seven key elements. We need accurate data. What is accurate data? It's error-free data. We need fresh eyes. We need to set different boundaries to map out the data in the right way. We need to have comparable, and consistent data. Because comparable, comparability is the goal of consistency and consistency helps achieve comparability. The data provision on the very top is a very important aspect because we need to access data from the source system. So in our case, in real estate, from the local utility providers to the target system. In our case, Sierra or Sierra Plus. Having timeliness data in place is really important. We believe that we need to have the right data available and accessible within a system. Data assurance, what's data assurance? With data assurance, we believe that we have to correct errors while data is transitioned from a source system to a target system. And last but not least, balanced data sets are important and contain all elements observed over a time frame. Example, if we compare, just like in the grass reporting, different time periods, we need full data coverage. So if we have water consumption data missing in May and June, it's not really comparable or benchmark. Next slide, please. At Evora Global, we believe the human element is really important. So we have a five-step onboarding plan. Key requirements are here, maybe first, the first box, the third box, and the fifth. So we talk about business requirements, user requirements, and last but not least, how to mobilize the data. We have to ask the following questions. Where is the data coming from? Where is the, or who is making the data available? Who is responsible for the data? And what are the outputs? Or how can the outputs look like? That's why we have a dedicated data team. And that's why I call it the human element who takes care of the data transition in order to understand the main requirements, to define those requirements from a user perspective, to get and identify the best data from the data sources and to then mobilize and train the key stakeholders to take action. Next one, please. Again, over the last years, we talked a lot about how to best collect data. I think now we really have to think about how to make data actionable. Next one, please. So we have to do our homework. This is our, those are our core principles of data acquisition. Let's start with the homework, the DD, the due diligence. How are we gonna mobilize the data? We're gonna do this jointly with our clients to set out key requirements 
how to best acquire the data, wherever different you know, data silos they're coming from, maybe utility providers, you know, different property managers, facility managers, or even external advisors. We then, step four, transition the data. We, again, validate the data with our dedicated data team in order to publish reports, train the team, and then, as we in German say, create automatismus to finally have action plans setting up and forward impact. Next one, please. I think it's important how we make data usable and repeat. From a software perspective, I think there are four key elements. Number one, how to acquire data, how to maintain the data, how to best use the data, and then share or publish the data. So this is from software perspective. But again, at Evora, with our 120 plus leading experts, we believe we have to discover jointly how to get the best data into the system to profile them and follow certain rules in order to best monitor and then report. Next one, please. Our Sierra ecosystem, which I will touch on now, we believe that there is no data. There's no ESG with data. Why? On the next slide, I will explain how we live and breathe data because we can connect both, both worlds, tech and human. This is the Sierra ecosystem. From left to right, we acquire, we collect the utility data, hopefully in an automated approach, which is quite possible. If not, for some data quality issues or data regulation, like in Germany, we have external or third-party people reaching out through service to get maybe tenant data. And then through the automated data acquisition approach, we manage the data within the Sierra ecosystem. So we have different types of storage, different types of data management approaches. We check the data quality, we validate it. We offer you different user fund and asset views. We have a bunch of deep data analytics and then last but not least, um, different performance and reporting modules. On the very top in light blue, you see our main five modules. Next to the grass module, I would like to touch on the net zero carbon module. Net zero carbon pathway, and I think we already heard a lot from Jens and Emmanuel, is the next big thing. And let me explain in a couple of seconds how we approach it. Next slide, please. For all those key modules, like the net zero carbon piece, like Sierra Plus, the human element is key in order to unlock performance together. What does it mean? When we talk about Evora Global and agenda setting, strategy work, we directly talk about Sierra, how to have the fundamental data as a basis of a core strategy. But the most important piece is here, the last one, the dedicated data team who acquires or approaches data within a couple of weeks for our clients. Because you can have the best system in place if it's not running with the right data in it, I think we are not getting on the right track. And how this team is actually performing or approaching different, different um, issues, because next to software, I think it's key to have not only the human element, but people behind, because in the end, real estate is still a people's business. And we're just connecting people and teams in order to work as close um, as possible to reach a common target. And now I will touch on expectations and a bit how expectations meet the net zero carbon module and the grass model. So the net zero carbon module is based on the CRAM model as Jens and Emmanuel pointed out, same in our case. It's more important than ever. We believe in times of floods and heat wave, or last but not least the pandemic, we need to be on top of those issues. While countries are to use a new legislation, it's really key to have data um, behind it in order to map out a net zero carbon pathway. The net zero carbon pathway helps to find the optimal path, helps to show you a stranding point. And this is something, again, we do with you and with our people to map out the best net zero carbon pathway and to show or anticipate a stranding point. So it's really there to scope and visualize your tra trajectory of your decarbonization pathway. And now I will talk maybe two minutes about Sierra Plus on the next slide, because we believe Sierra Plus and Emmanuel, I'm happy that you pointed it out early on. Property managers are the ones who are closest to the asset. They have the most insight and the most time to spend as close to the asset as possible. And with Sierra Plus, we just introduced 
a not only unique and new tool in its um, way to take action, but also to have a software solution place for, dial, for daily uh, management when it comes to action setting or creating um, digital ESG passports. It's a powerful tool to enable users to actively manage ESG performance. It provides a clear picture of all assets and the most important fact, it assigns actions clearly to see results. So it's easy to use, it's intuitive, and it's made by and for professionals. Next one, please. I want to finish off with expectations, Ingemar, and how to manage them from start to finish. My last slide now is we'll talk a bit about how we, together with our clients, not only try to monitor the performance and how to set expectations, but also how to keep the client satisfied and keep them informed. Because when we talk about expectations, we want to create the wow moment, the wow moment or the aha effect in German for our clients. We want our clients to be future-proof and be maybe a step ahead. How? We work closely in order to set clear deliverables, be authentic, regular communication. We have many customers where we have almost daily or weekly calls in order to kind of adjust different initiatives or issues when it comes to the net zero carbon pathway or close active asset management. So we have to set realistic expectations, be transparent and honest in order that software implementation, and again, we talk about software and data, is, well, fully successful. In order to avoid this, we believe that software is key because on the very last slide, I will finish off with what happened 50 years ago in Sweden after they switched from left-hand left hand, um, driving to right-hand signing. So we believe this is a joint approach that we have to do this together with a client as a service provider. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Ayasha, um, also for the, for the image in the end. Um, so, um, <clears throat> and I'm very glad if I look at the, uh, at the time uh, that we managed um, to stay uh, with our, with our, within our schedule here. Um, and we actually kind of have a few more minutes uh, for Q&A than, than we expected, which would be the good thing. Um, so I would like to jump right into this. Um, I mean, we, we've all seen a, a lot of theory now when it comes to software and data collection. So, so thanks also for sharing um, your, let's say, different approaches, at least to a, to a certain extent. Um, <clears throat> I think what we've seen through all three presentations is that there is still a human aspect to it. So, and that's maybe uh, also one of the reasons uh, why we thought based on, on our market experience that it might be a valuable contribution here today uh, to see a little bit um, digital solutions on, on ESG performance data. But um, there might be a lot of uh, um, listeners here today um, which are still kind of at this point um, of how do we actually start this process? Do we actually need a tool? Yes or no? And what can a tool realistically do? So the session was also a little bit intended um, on expectation management whenever it comes to digitalization. Um, I think it has become clear in, in all three presentations. Um, we are not quite there yet that we can just push a button and everything comes in. Um, so human interaction is still necessary and it's kind of that's aligned with our experience um, as a consultant uh, across Europe. Um, so I think all four of us kind of share that experience. Um, but I would like to, to start off um, maybe with, with you, Emmanuel, and DeepKey. Um, <clears throat> I've seen all the various interfaces you can connect to. Um, maybe as, let's say, a non-German here, uh, maybe you could share a, a few of your experiences uh, you had with a few of your German clients or uh, especially German assets um, how difficult do you, do you really think it is um, in Germany, let's say, to, to move from a more human-based data collection to more, towards a fully automated um, um, solution? And, and happy to see, especially your, your experience as an, as an outsider, so to speak, uh, when it comes to a few of the, let's say, German specifics around data collection, a provider landscape, et cetera. Yes, thank you, Ingemar. Um, you're right to point out uh, Germany has 
is like a, a specific country in Europe. Um, just not to point out someone or somebody, uh, German is not the only issue in Europe for getting data, don't worry. But that's right that in certain country, uh, you know, all monopolistic uh, enterprise for uh, grid operators and utilities could be a benefit today. For example, in Spain, in France, in Italy, and even in the UK, actually, it's easier to get access to the data. When we talk about Germany, uh, we have two uh, clear issues. The first one is clearly uh, the smart metering deployments, which is not so advanced, I would say, uh, to be polite, uh, meaning that there is still many utilities using uh, or, uh, that won't be able to get access uh, with data automation. But the first way to do it is clearly to get access directly to the web portal of the utilities. So that's possible. We, we can't say that is not possible, but that's possible. But then there is also like a, a perhaps a more uh, a pregnant um, uh, issue on uh, privacy for tenants uh, authorization, especially. And then uh, I would say it's two obstacles to get automate, automate data, to get access to the automate, automation and smart metering, and then to be sure uh, to, communi to, communi to communicate properly with tenants to get access to those data. Uh, so yes, there is more obstacle than in other countries, but again, that's possible. You probably saw that there is some uh, 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 utilities are now to, to start deploying um, uh, uh, smart metering. So you probably all heard about companies like Discovery, for example. Um, and that's a first possibility to get access to that. Secondly, the market is moving fast in Germany. Uh, when we uh, started three years ago, to get access to tenants data wasn't possible. Like, it's a no. But then, since uh, last year, uh, the market is switching a little bit. USG is now uh, clearly a topic, a discussion between uh, the tenants and the owner or the asset manager. Uh, and the property manager is more aware, and you probably know that uh, huge, uh, big companies, uh, as property management companies, are clearly now aware of, yes, I have to get those data. I have to get access to that. So that will be a topic of discussion with my tenants. So. I would say that uh, if you if you could lead a project in one year in some countries, it could be more than one to three years to have a proper automation in Germany. So it's perhaps a longer journey today, but we can't say that it's not possible. Yeah, so thanks, Emmanuel, for the insight. Um, I think I, I saw Yosha nodding a few times also, Jens. Um, so um, I would really hand it over to, to Jens in that respect. Um, because you are probably here the, uh, the, uh, have the deepest insights on when it comes to carbon risk evaluation. Um, and what we see then in the market is that like, both developments go a little bit in parallel. So uh, German stakeholders are starting their collection. Um, um, maybe not quite there yet, um, but still um, they have the, uh, the request um, either by their by their end investors to make some sort um, of analysis when it comes to to climate risks, um, and there we kind of see a, a, um, a challenge currently uh, having a data set which is maybe rather limited at this point in time. Yeah, but then still there is the urgent need of the market yeah, to give, for example, answers. Um, in terms of CREMP. So Jens, maybe you can touch on that a little bit, um, how, how you deal with that in your practice. Um, and, and based on your experience, how much estimation is actually allowed um, to populate a CREMP tool? Or would you also say as, as one of the developers, please don't do that, um, um, just use it for assets where you have full coverage. What's your take on this? Yes, thanks for that question. Um, so there are a lot of, questions around how to correctly apply that CREM methodology and framework. So I had to tell the people quite often that using market-based emissions and green electricity is just no key um, measure to, to reduce an asset's uh, stranding risk. So it's a contractual agreement between you as a company and um, your energy provider and not a quality of the building itself. And yeah, when it comes to estimating missing data, it's somehow comparable. So 
if you estimate what is what is usually missing it's the tenant electricity usually so and it's been missing for the entire time series so when it comes to heating energy there's often smaller data gaps that can be quite nicely filled and estimated so we also offer this as a service for our customers but if more is missing um, the more you are missing uh, and estimating the more you get average because usually you estimate based on statistical averages so what is the typical office building consuming with regards to energy average so and what is the the starting point of the creme decarbonization pathways it's the average consumption and carbon emissions in a certain country and asset class. So what will happen? You will perform average. You meet the initial um, target pathway. But of, of course, if you have no data at all, that's what you have to do. You have to do some assumptions. And this is also what we offer to our customers. Um, I cannot really tell you what, for example, the BaFin um, accepts when it comes to estimations. Um, I've, they, they don't publish this exactly, um, but we've heard now from different customers we talked with that Barfin told them they are using the CREM targets as indicator to measure where the fund is compatible with Article 8 of the SFDR. Um, so, but maybe we can do some more research on exactly that point that you pointed out, how much estimation is possible. But of course, can just recommend you to include tenant electricity with estimations in any CREM assessment and don't just skip it because then you will, of course, underestimate your carbon risk. Yeah. yeah. And no worry, I didn't want to run you in a very precise answer. So um, I was aware that you might want to stay a bit more vague at, at one of the other points, but that was actually also my intention uh, because I think it's really on probably everyone on this call uh, moving forward like to carve out these ed these edges yeah and find ways and solutions so um that's that's another uh, maybe point on your expectation management here um we believe that this is this is all very new uh, we don't really have the the full data coverage as we've learned also so the, so this session and we heard about the obstacles and we heard that it's a journey and not a, not a one-off um, so uh, we believe that it's really uh, on all stakeholders to work on exactly these edges and try to, to find these definitions um, where, let's say, Jens also stayed a bit vague at the moment. So we probably couldn't have been more precise anyhow. Um, so uh, maybe passing that on uh, to Ayosha, to who also um, like pairing uh, their software with sustainable finance uh, consulting here. Um, knowing that we are not with estimations um, down this route when we talk about climate risk, um, how serious can then the evaluations, let's say, in the due diligence process be, or also based on, on the on the uh, on the CREM estimations we've just seen from Warren in his introduction? Um, what do you think, Ayosha? How let's say how stable is that? for an investor moving forward and to base decisions on that um, what kind of knowledge maybe also needs to go to the investor side in order to to make the right judgments on these let's say pretty images we just saw on our screen um, uh, what do you think uh, what needs to be on the on the client side or which level of understanding do maybe also all of us whether it's a software provider or a consultant um, to which level do we need to bring our clients so that they can make um, proper decisions in terms of their investments? Because we are not talking maybe like 10 years ago, whether or not someone can calculate his carbon footprint. Um, we suddenly have investment decisions on the table um, and ESG and also a grand pathway is part of that decision-making process. So it's not writing a report anymore it's part of the business concept. So, so what do you think? Where, where, where does the market need to get to? Good question, Ingemar. First of all, I think we have to, I, I can only warn, I think we have to be careful to make over promises. Um, that's why I kind of mentioned earlier on that we have weekly calls because in the past we, you know, 
kind of um, targets and and you know the journey changed you know within years now we have months monthly or almost weekly changes. So we try to stay as close as possible to, to our clients when it comes to, to you know, mapping out that net zero carbon pathway or you know, different, let's say, uh, statements they're announcing or even in an in a ESG DD, because today a ESG DD is maybe just a five or eight page um, long you know, analysis. So we believe um, it's, it's, it makes more sense to maybe tag an ESG passport to, to a single asset to make it as transparent as possible. Not only to have um, a pretty clear message to the market, hey, this is a rather green asset, um, but um, we have to go, kind of move away from, from, from trying to, yeah, to, to kind of overpromise. And um, 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 I think the, the, the industry as such is, is doing a good job while communi communicating openly. And I just saw this question in the chat about ECOR and others. It is important to see how uh, we can, because this is, finally, it's a joint effort. We can only do this together with worthy rivals and, and with the clients together, because um, in the end, it is, um, it's on us and our clients. So it's an it's a industry effort. So uh, may it be on you know, the net zero carbon piece or even the, the um, sustainable finance piece. So that's, that's what I learned over the last weeks, actually, um, being back to business travel. Um, maybe going to a little bit more uh, smaller example here, um, going over to Manuel, um, you're also looking into the French regulations, right? Uh, when you collect data um, in deep key, um, and maybe that's maybe that's a framework which which might be a little bit more easy to to grasp uh, to to grasp at this point in time as a, as an as an example. What what is what is your experience? Um, maybe really looking into the French market, Emmanuel, uh, when it comes to that specific service of um, of checking the French regulation. I mean, it can be also the Spanish, German, whatever in the future. But maybe you might have the best data and the best knowledge, um, let's say, about this specific piece. So, um, how do your clients perceive that? Let's say that that item of the software. Uh, what kind of discussions do you have with your with your with your clients about the outcome? And maybe also be honest. Um, how precise do you think you know you are in that specific area at this point in time, and what and what was your learning curve? Yeah, same to you, Mark. Um, uh, about that, you, you're, you're right. You're right. Talking about outcomes, actually, it's clearly the the topic is how to get all the data um, uh, available and possible, and then to work on outcomes, because outcomes could be European regulation, it could be local regulation, it could be voluntary initiatives and any initiatives. Just because uh, when we started a few years ago, um, uh, funds and asset manager answer to many initiatives, and actually it's, it was a project each time, meaning that just uh, the grasp assessment is one project, then we go through the project of the ESG reporting end of the year, then we go to the ESG uh, regulation from uh, country by country. That The purpose is clearly to just, uh, um, it is clearly a momentum now where we have to take uh, all the, like, like, like you said, uh, I shall see also all the initiative in front of us and actual initiatives. And let's start to have like a, a, a common ESG strategy, including some outcomes, clearly. But uh, your question is how could we deal with that is clearly uh, for the moment, the more stronger regulation are the most uh, uh, focused for our customer, meaning clearly SFDI is one. And then you have strong regulation in UK, in, in France, you're right, because, but I assume that sooner or later, uh, the financial regulation uh, led by Europe, SFDR, and then soon taxonomy, will be stronger than local regulation. Actually, sometimes, for example, in France, it's a good example, the regulation is not clear about the objective between the ownership and uh, the tenants, meaning that it's a regulation more dedicated on the buildings. When Europe is taking care of the financial institutions, meaning that clearly it's the ownership of the buildings that lead uh, the, the, and actually, for French, it's 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 a blurred uh, issue about who is owning the answer to this regulation. Because sometimes the owners say, "No, it's not my problem," because the occupant is a single tenant, and I don't want to worry about that. And sometimes the tenants say, "Okay, what I want, what what do I want with this? your building? Actually, I can't just uh, refurbish it." So at the end, I'm sure that the European regulation will be more stronger. Just if I may, one point about the question before: um, we are talking about the risk. And there is clearly two risks. And, and, and when we started, it wasn't the case. But first, it is a performance risk. We're talking about stranded assets, about the efficiency of the assets. And now the asset managers and the investor 
want to be sure that in 2030 and 2050, their asset will be like uh, 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 best practices on the market. That's clearly a question of the value. So it's a performance risk. And then you add on top of that the resilience risk, meaning that you could have the most efficient building of the world if it is like in a flood uh, situation or in a heat wave situation in 2050. It is a risk uh, and at stake, and uh, you have to take care about that. And clearly, the regulation and all the initiatives, including RIS, are taking account this one, meaning that when you want to have ESG uh, information about one building during the due deal, for example, you have to be able to assess both performance issue and also resilience issue. Yeah, thanks, Emmanuel. Maybe, maybe we pass on the, the resilience bit um, to either um, Ayosha and or Jens. Um, well, what's your take on this? Uh, I think on Ayosha's slide, I, I saw uh, as part of the, the, the package um, also the, the term resilience. Um, Jens, I, I haven't seen it on your slides, but nevertheless, I, I believe you're also working on something in that respect. Um, so maybe both of you, I don't know who, who wants to give a start, just just uh, go either of you. Um, how do you see that that physical risk uh, topic and, and how do you maybe either are planning to implement it or how have you implemented it already and, and what's kind of the, the client feedback? Let me start first, Jens. <laughs> yeah, we already, I mean, um, climate resilience is really important, as Emma already said, and it's, you know, it's, it's a huge demand out there and, you know, clients are asking for it more and more and we just, we just, um, you know, implemented it these days or these weeks. So um, we need to map out the, you know, kind of um, the different portfolios of our clients to see what is, you know, the, 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 the main risk and then, you know, I always had a different flood risk, heat waves, etc. So the performance issue is fine. We did this. You know, this is something we are already actively tracking. But um, the climate and thanks to maybe the pandemic or different, you know, local local floods like in Germany, um, people um, not generally but in the sector, in this, you know, in our real estate sector, are more and more getting becoming aware of it. So it's 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 kind of in the boardroom. Finally, we believe that um, we can take action. But sometimes they they should still think it's uh, they have to map out a couple of assets instead of kind of screening the whole portfolio and what we try to to um, approach is that we do a first gap analysis to see hey which assets of your portfolio are actually you know affected or maybe can be affected within the next years already so um, this is quite quite um, accelerating over the last days over to you Jens. Yes. Thanks, Um So we also observe that more and more customers are requesting such feature physical climate risks. And yeah, so we have not implemented that yet. It's on our roadmap. And we with our, we've also discussed uh, with some insurance companies and reinsurance companies now that we are willing to partner with. So this might be also bi-directional um, exchange, by the way. So it's not only that they can provide us with information on local hazard situation, um, but we can, with our digital twin concept, collecting detailed data about the buildings, we can also support them in improving their underwriting process by getting together and joining the spatial hazard information with that information that's, that is finally necessary to really estimate the vulnerability and so for the, the resilience of each individual asset. Ingemar, maybe to finish off on that, um, just to give an idea out of our now, I think 120 or 125 professionals, we have 20 people only focusing on, on the climate resilience piece. So this is, you know, this is, I we will have a huge take up and, and will be maybe hopefully in 2022 already one of the biggest issues. So this is maybe the biggest demand and not only, again, I can only, you know, underline and, you know, push on the fact that software is great and supporting it, but we need, you know, the human element, people directly advising and supporting our clients with their challenges, because those challenges are not like in the past, you know, um, long-term or mid-term challenges. No, they, they change from week to week. So, um, maybe that's a, that's a good point uh, before we start opening up um, to the audience. Uh, I, Ayosha, I take this as your top kind of recommendation 
moving forward. Um, so you've covered the human element. Uh, so maybe over to Emmanuel. Human element has been taken out of the of the top list by Yosha already. Uh, Emmanuel, what, what do you think is the 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 second uh, most important bit? Um, and then Jens, maybe you can you can bring in the third important element in terms of priorities um, before we then open it up. Um, um, to the audience. After, after human elements, what is the key, key issue? That just uh, don't mix like uh, setting up an ESG strategy with set up, setting up a software. That's a good recommendation, meaning that software must be part of your uh, whole strategy uh, with your stakeholders, but also your own organization. And it's not just only buying a software and then implementing it. It's, it's more, and actually just, it's a good news for the market. ESG is now a business topic for real estate. That's really a good news. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, human intelligence will still be the key driver for this. So we can only support this with our professional services and, and artificial intelligence, but we can support this process. Finally, we just want to provide the tools that companies need to go their individual roadmap towards net zero. And therefore, first of all, we need some commitment to pledge to perform against certain targets and to decarbonize as soon as possible. Yeah, then thanks for your uh, uh, summaries towards the end. Um, I think uh, Warren, Sasha, we, we also invite Warren now probably to the panel, right? Um, so maybe there are also some questions on, on his part of the presentation. Um, so um, please feel free uh, to post your, your, your questions in the Q&A tool. Um, I think that's the preferred route. Um, so that's your chance here um, to ask Ayosha, Emmanuel, Jens, um, and or Warren um, on whatever was maybe missing on the presentation or where you would like to see more, more insights. Um, please uh, just go ahead. Oh, and if, if there aren't any questions, um, because I haven't seen any popping up yet, but maybe people are still typing, um, Warren will then um, also have a short summary um, on what we've heard here today and kind of uh, give next steps and, and, and close out the session um, if there are no, no other questions. Um, so, but uh, maybe we just give the folks uh, just a few minutes and Warren, you can think over um, whenever you think um, the time is right. Yeah, I can start and uh, if questions come in, great. I'm sure the panel and I are happy to field them. Um, thank you for everyone that participated today. Obviously, thank you to um, Ingemar uh, for uh, emceeing the event, uh, Mayosh, Emmanuel and Jens for their thoughts as, and also great partners of Gresb. Um, and just really looking forward to the future and all uh, we can do together. Um, and I think uh, I don't have a lot on my end to close with. I think it was a very comprehensive and uh, an exciting dialogue. And I hope the audience enjoyed it as much as I did. Great. Then I think if there aren't any questions, Warren, I think uh, we are more than happy to invite everyone to the other side um, or maybe have a, a listen uh, into the uh, recording uh, afterwards. Um, and in case there are any questions by any of the participants, I think uh, also feel free to reach out via email um, to any of us. I think we are uh, more than happy uh, to provide you with the respective answers. Um, so, and then we are a little bit ahead of time, but I don't think people mind um, these days uh, because we've spent most of our times in front of the screen doing exactly these things. So sometimes if you break out minutes, uh, uh, very valuable. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, thanks Warren uh, and the team behind GRESP to make that possible. Thanks Ayosha, Emmanuel and Jens um, for your contributions um, and happy to meet next time. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. Have a good one.